This is the extended version of our 15 minute fundamentals interview with Teddy Woodward from Notional Finance, a fixed rate and fixed term lending protocol built on Ethereum. Hey Teddy, welcome to 15 Minute Fundamentals. It's great to have you on. Thanks for having me, I'm excited. Uh, to kick things off, it'd be great if you can give a quick intro to Notional Finance for those not yet familiar. Sure, so uh, Notional is a lending protocol on Ethereum. Um, we've been around since January of 2020, so it's, it's almost three years. Although uh, we launched Notional V2, which is when we sort of started to get serious TVL. That was almost a year ago. So we've, we've been uh, live with Notional V2 for, for something like 10 months now and currently have something like $110 million of TVL. And the special thing about Notional, so what makes us different, is that we are a fixed rate lending protocol. So, you know, prior to Notional, users in DeFi were only able to lend and borrow at variable rates that would change a lot over time. And what Notional does is it allows people to lend and borrow at uh, fixed rates of interest. Great overview and also pretty much covered like the main uh, innovation that you introduced to the market as well. Um, on that topic, could you walk us through how the fixed rate and fixed term loans work under the hood? Sure. There's a lot going on technically, sort of uh, under the hood, and and most of this, if you're if you're you know just a simple user, this is all going to be abstracted away from you in general, right? So uh, you won't need to know the depths of, of how Notional works, but but I'll, I'll explain it. So basically, the core concept here is called Fcash, and Fcash is is like a zero coupon bond in that it is defined by a currency type and a maturity date. So for example, December 2022 USDC is an Fcash token. And what that means is that that token is tradable and transferable and on its maturity date. So on December 2022, it is redeemable for one USDC on Notional, right? So it effectively represents USDC at a specific future date. That's what's special about Fcash. And the way we use this to enable fixed rate borrowing and lending is we allow people to trade between USDC today and USDC at specific future dates as represented by Fcash. So actually, when you are borrowing and lending, what you're actually doing is buying and selling Fcash. Okay, so think about it from a lender's perspective. So I have my USDC and I want to lend at a 5% fixed rate for the next six months, right? So uh, I wanna lend until March of next year. What I'm actually doing on Notional is I'm selling my USDC today and I'm purchasing March, 2023 USDC. And the exchange rate at which I make that trade implies a fixed interest rate over that period of time. So I might sell 100 USDC and get in return 102 March 2023 USDC, right? Which means that I'm earning two USDC of interest over the next six months, you know, which is like a, a 4% annualized return. So that's how Fcash works. And, and, and basically we have liquidity pools on Notional for each maturity where we have USDC on one side and, and Fcash on the other side in these liquidity pools. And so you know, when you borrow and lend, what you're what you're doing is you're trading with a liquidity pool. Yeah, and that's that's kind of the basics of how it works. Awesome, uh, great, clear overview of a technical concept. And like you said, from a user's perspective, it's it's a lot more straightforward. But always good to know what's going on under the hood. Now, uh, Fcash being the main innovation, I know you also have N tokens. Uh, do you just want to quickly explain what the role of N tokens is? So we have these liquidity pools, right? So the USDC, the Fcash, right? In order for end users to be able to borrow and lend, we need capital in these liquidity pools. And end tokens are a way of making it really, really simple for liquidity providers to provide liquidity to, to those liquidity pools. So end tokens are actually new in Notional v2. In Notional v1, what we had was liquidity providers providing liquidity to individual liquidity pools. So, so for example, uh, on USDC, we currently have three tradable liquidity pools. We have December 2022, you know, March 2023, and I think September 2023, right? So those are three different maturities and three different liquidity pools. Back in Notional v1, liquidity providers would have to choose which liquidity pool they wanted to put their money into. And this was like, it 
added a lot of burden to liquidity providers because, you know, first of all, they had to make that choice. And how were they supposed to make that choice? It was not clear which one you would rather do. And then also it required a lot of engagement because once we reached maturity, then it was basically like, okay, well, liquidity providers had to take action and they had to roll their liquidity to a future maturity for it to still be sort of useful. Right. And so that was like a really not like not a great UX. And so what N tokens do is they actually abstract all that away from the liquidity provider and just like essentially automate it all on their behalf. So now what liquidity providers do is they just mint N tokens. So if you have USDC, you're going to mint N USDC as liquidity provider and sort of behind the scenes. What that's going to do is it's going to take your USDC and distribute it to the each different liquidity pool based on governance parameters of what share goes to which liquidity pool. And then it will automatically roll it forward as the liquidity pools mature, right? So it takes away all that stuff and you don't have to do deal with any of that as a liquidity provider. Okay, got it. So so you could say that it's somewhat from a user's perspective, similar to say C tokens on compound, but in the back end, you're handling a much more complex solution. But for users, it's very streamlined. That's exactly right. What we try to do in Notional, like, as you can tell already, you know, there's there's this is like a technically complicated protocol, right? There's like, there's a lot of stuff going on. And, and what we really try and do as best we can is try and make it such that users don't need to understand how it works. <laughs> yeah, as it should be. And that's what this space requires as well. Um, zoom out a bit from the technicals. Uh, let's speak about the financials and the whole economic model of Notional. So if you could just walk through who pays fees for what and when and who they accrue to. So what's the split between liquidity providers and the protocol? Yeah. So I've noticed that with lending protocols, you guys classify the interest that borrowers pay to lenders as fees that the protocol generates? Yes, supply side revenue. So fees paid that accrue to supply side participants. So in this case, the lenders. Yeah, so so this is actually kind of an interesting, it's a complicated one for Notional because there's basically two kinds of fees. On the one hand, uh, when you borrow on Notional, you're, you're, you're paying interest, right? And that, and, and essentially that interest is going to liquidity providers or lenders. Now, I don't believe the token terminal captures that for us. Instead, the way uh, we define fees is like, basically anytime somebody borrows or lends, they're, they're trading on a liquidity pool, right? And, and similar to a, a Uniswap or a balancer, uh, we charge a transaction fee uh, anytime somebody borrows or lends. And uh, that transaction fee is split between liquidity providers and the protocol. Um, so, you know, again, similar to what you'd see in, in sort of regular exchanges. So it's, it's an interesting thing with Notional because you've got like this, these two, depends how you want to think of like, what is a fee? Now, I think if you included the interest that borrowers paid, the fee number would look a lot higher. Um, but like Notional doesn't get any part of that where Notional gets paid is like this transaction sort of trading fee. We get, uh, basically a cut of every one of those fees. Yeah, as you said, we're currently only tracking the trading fees paid, which is split 80-20 between liquidity providers and the protocol as seen on the revenue share chart here. Pure interest fees paid are not showcased, but once they're added, viewers will get to see that 100% of these go to the supply side participants, as you mentioned, so they don't affect the protocol's earnings in any way and are thus not an indicator of financial performance directly. But we'll, of course, work together on adding these in the near future so the dashboard shows the entire picture of all economic activity on Notional, right? So both value flowing through the protocol and to the protocol so that anybody looking at the dashboard can understand how user activity develops and how you as Notional are able to capture that value from the activity. And in general on this user activity, what would you say are the main drivers and challenges related to your growth right now? I would say there's three sort of user groups for Notional, right? So there's in the same way as like a as a DEX. Notional has lenders, borrowers, and liquidity providers in the same way that a DEX has liquidity providers and then, you know, buyers and sellers, right? And I think what we've seen is succeeded in attracting liquidity. We have sufficient liquidity so that people can lend and borrow. We have also succeeded 
in getting people to lend on Notional. You know, we take security very seriously. And I think that that has been like well reflected in the fact that users are willing to lend to Notional for, you know, not super high interest rates, because I think they think that they see us as, you know, a, a high quality and, and, and sort of low risk protocol, which makes me feel very nice. Uh, so anyway, so I think lenders and liquidity providers, like we've been able, we've sort of succeeded in, in getting those guys on board. I think the the challenging thing has been getting uh, borrowing demand. And, you know, I think this has been challenging, honestly, for every lending protocol on DeFi. And part of it's market conditions related. So, you know, there's just like less of a demand for leverage because everybody's gotten washed out over the last six months. Right. So that's that's part of it. But it's also the case that like, well, maybe the just the demand for sort of borrowing over collateralized against crypto assets. So just the vanilla over collateralized borrowing demand. Well, maybe that's just like not that big. Maybe it's like not actually as big as you might have thought or hoped. That has been a challenge for us. Now, what we're doing to sort of combat that, we we publish details of our newest sort of product that we're about to launch next month uh, called Leveraged Vaults. We published those details yesterday, if, if anybody wants to take a look. But I think that this is going to be a huge improvement for, for Notional and for DeFi lending in general. And it's going to drive a ton of borrowing demand on the protocol. You know, what this product is, is basically it gives users the ability to borrow on Notional fixed and deposit that cash directly into whitelisted smart contracts that execute specific yield strategies. Right? And the innovation here is that the assets that sit in the yield strategy act as collateral for the loan. So it means that you can borrow like up to, you know, something like 10 times the initial capital that you're depositing, right? It's a complicated concept. It's, it's easiest to explain with an example. So like uh, one of our first yield strategies is going to be, you know, you're going to be taking USDC, providing liquidity on balancer, staking the LP tokens on Aura and harvesting these incentives. And what a user is going to be able to do is, you know, maybe they'll bring 100K to Notional and they'll be able to borrow 700K on Notional and then take the total 800K and deposit it into that strategy. And then they earn the difference between the strategy's returns and the fixed rate on Notional, like on 10 times their initial capital, right? Or, or eight times in this case. And yeah, so, th so that's a leverage fault. We think that this is going to be a, you know, a huge step forward and create borrowing demand because it basically makes DeFi lending like much more efficient, right? Because like a lot of users in DeFi, like that's what they're borrowing to do. They're borrowing to put their capital into a yield strategy. And so we sort of like make that direct and make that happen in one click with like op with like maximal capital efficiency by allowing the strategy itself to be collateral on notional right so it like dramatically cuts down the sort of capital requirement for sort of the end user yeah leveraged vaults sound really fascinating like a solid addition to notional's product suite um you mentioned Balancer and Aura um in your example there and I was wondering what kind of role partnerships play in a building these new products and just B generally driving growth for Notional? I think partnerships are, are hugely beneficial and uh, they're one of the greatest things about DeFi, right? Is, you know, we're building open source, open source code. Our partners build open source code and that makes it possible to have integrations and partnerships that function at, at like a very, very deep level. So, you know, I think that integrations going forward are going to drive a ton of growth and we've already, you know, we've already done some and we're going to do more. You know, for example, these leveraged vaults that I, that I just talked about, we're launching with an initial set of strategies that uses Balancer and Aura. So we're going to be putting capital on Balancer and then putting that capital on Aura. So we'll, we're going to integrate with other protocols in the future to do sort of other leveraged vault strategies. So that's going to drive a lot of growth. And then on the lending side, uh, we've actually got two sort of bond ETFs about to come online about the same time as Leverage Vaults. So IndexCoop is launching a product as well as this protocol called Future. 
And both of these products, they're ERC-20 sort of bond funds that lend fixed on Notional and then roll that lending forward, sort of manage the maturities for lenders. So lenders just get an easy access to an ERC-20 token that is like auto rolling forward. And those are also two big integrations that make it really easy for lenders to provide capital to Notional, right? And I think that those in combination with like the integrations on the leverage fault side are, are going to drive like a ton of volume. And, and it's because Notional is an open source protocol. And I think that this is like the great thing about DeFi. Yeah, 100% agree. And I'll actually make sure to um, add some info about the leveraged vaults into the show notes. Anyone interested in diving deeper can do that. On the fact that you're open source protocol, I wanted to ask that, do, do you experience lots of organic community contributions to Notional's code base? And is that something you encourage at all? So it depends what you mean by community. Because like, in some sense, yes, right? Like Index Coop, Future, uh, Yearn is also putting capital on Notional. Like these are other sort of protocols or businesses that are engaging with Notional, building stuff that uses Notional's code base. So I think it's like a question of like, what do you consider to be community? You know, because I think some, sometimes when people say that, they tend to be thinking of like, you know, people who are hobbyists or who aren't necessarily like doing this professionally. So I think that we, we've certainly got like people that are sort of in DeFi professionally. Now, when it comes to sort of community contributors contributing to the Notional core code base, like we have a grants program, we have people that are sort of building ancillary products like dashboards and stuff on top of Notional, but we have not really had like community contributors to the core code. And I'm not sure that that's something that that we would have in the future either, honestly, just because like it is so, so sensitive. Good, good point on the definition of community. Like you need to split it between the professional DeFi protocol community and then that you have like different ways that you want the community individuals who are fans of the protocol, et cetera, to contribute via building dashboards and other things that support Notional's business, right? Somewhat related to that topic uh, at this stage, I'd love to hear what the role of the note token is and how it's being used, and especially from maybe a token incentive perspective. Sure. So the note is Notional's governance token. Um, it is currently used for governance. There's a staking program for note. And basically what the staking program, the idea is you can stake your note and that staking earns you a reward. And it also benefits the Notional protocol in two ways. First of all, when you stake your note, what you're actually doing is staking an 80-20 note ETH balancer LP token. When you stake your note, you are contributing to note liquidity. That's the first benefit to Notional. The second benefit is that it acts as a kind of safety module in the, in the same way as if you're familiar with Aave's safety module, where basically all staked note can be used in the event of a protocol insolvency. So up to 50% of the capital sitting in the staked note contract can be used in the event of a protocol insolvency to sort of make the protocol whole. So this is like, you know, if there's a smart contract hack or a liquidation failure um, that blows through the protocol's cash reserves, this is kind of a last resort, what we can do to sort of protect Notional's users. So we can take 50% of the value sitting in the staked note contract and use that. Okay, so that's, uh, you know, just making Notional safer and more secure protocol for end users. So those are the benefits to Notional. Now the rewards for staking Note come in the form of protocol reinvestments. So basically, so Notional is integrated with Compound. And what this means is that Notional accrues a lot of comp incentives. Over the lifespan of the company, we've, you know, we've accrued, you know, maybe 10, 10 to 15,000 comp. And what we do with this comp or what we have done so far is basically sold it for ETH and then taken that ETH and invested it into the 80-20 note ETH pool. So uh, converted that ETH into note ETH LP tokens, and then given those LP tokens to the staked note. So basically when you stake your note, you've got note ETH BPTs and you're earning more note ETH BPTs as we sell our comp and, and reinvest it into note. Great description of a somewhat complex system yet again. Quite interesting also to hear about the comp rewards and how you're utilizing those behind the scenes. But I'm gonna go on to a bit of a tangent here now uh, because I wanna speak about the merge. I noticed you um, 
put out a blog post where you spoke about that and how it might have some sort of effect on DeFi lending protocols. So what are your thoughts on do lending protocols face some kind of risks now around the merge? And is there some precautionary actions that need to be taken or that you are taking? Yeah, that's a good question. So let me just give you a kind of the backstory here. So when the merge happens, there's all this talk about that there's going to be a proof of work fork. And if you have ETH in your wallet over the merge, you're going to have ETH on this proof of work fork in addition to your ETH on sort of the main proof of stake chain, right? And so people want that because like, they're getting this free ETH proof of work token, right? And the idea is that like, if that has any value, then that's just free money that you'll be able to sell. And so basically what this has done is this created a situation where people are like, oh, let's just borrow ETH over, you know, the sort of one day to one to three day period of the merge. We can just borrow ETH. Then we'll have all this extra ETH in our wallet. So we'll get all this extra ETH proof of work. You know, maybe this thing's stuff's going to be valuable and we can sell it and make, make a lot of money. And in return, we only have to pay like one to three days of interest. It's like a small cost to pay, or that's the idea anyway. The thing is that like, if you assume that ETH proof of work has some not insignificant value, so if, you know, if people are assuming like ETH proof of work is going to be worth 3% of ETH proof of stake, then it like makes sense to borrow at really, really, really high interest rates purely from an economic standpoint, because you only have to pay that interest for like a very small period of time. So maybe you'd be willing to borrow at 500%, right? Because like you're going to get this lump sum payment uh, and you only have to pay that 500% for like three days, right? Um, <clears throat> and so this breaks a lot of the economic assumptions that DeFi lending protocols have relied on to be safe. Okay, so like basically here's the problem. So uh, DeFi lending protocols like, like Compound or Aave, they let you borrow against ETH that you've lent out. So, so the problem is that if the ETH market has 100% utilization, meaning all of it is lent out, and you're borrowing against ETH that you've lent out, it, it becomes very, very challenging for you to be liquidated because uh, when a liquidator wants to liquidate you, what he's gonna do is he's gonna take your ETH that you've lent out and then redeem it and trade it for the currency that you owe. Now, but if all of the ETH is lent out, then, then the liquidator cannot redeem your collateral. So they can't trade it and they can't do the little flash loan liquidation loop, right? So it essentially breaks the economic safety assumptions, or that, that's the problem. Now, the way that lending protocols have defended against this is interest rates increase with utilization. You know, if utilization approaches 100%, well, then the supply rates for ETH, you know, are supposed to go like, oh, they're 50% now. Surely somebody's going to come in and deposit ETH and lend because those rates are just so good. And that has usually been true but not over the merge, right? Because like, you again, you'd be willing to pay 500% interest, right? And so, you know, 50% interest rates, like it's just not good enough to get you to deposit. So these lending protocols are in a tricky spot. You know, they didn't foresee this and how could they have foreseen this? So that's, that's like the background of what the risk is. Now, having said all that, realistically, like I'm not worried because ultimately, I don't think that this ETH proof of work thing, I, I think this thing's like not going to get very far if it's going to even get off the ground at all. And I know a lot of other people feel the same way. And so what I think is more likely here is that, you know, people are like, oh, but everybody's going to be willing to pay 500%. And it's like, yeah, I mean, some people will be willing to pay that, but there will also be people that, that are willing to lend at that rate because they don't want to go through the, the hassle of trying to like sell this ETH proof of work. And they might just think that the ETH proof of work thing just isn't going to be worth anything. So like actually it's a better deal to give up your claim on ETH proof of work and instead lend at these interest rates. Yet again, super interesting stuff. And I promise you I'll definitely be staring at the utilization rates and interest rate curves uh, on different lending protocols during the merge just to see how this plays out. Now, I was wondering whether the things that you just mentioned affect Notional in any way, and are you taking any precautionary actions? I think Notional is a bit of a different case for a few reasons. So, so for one, like just the protocol like doesn't have a ton of ETH collateral risk. You know, we monitor our systemic risk and we know 
where all our accounts are sort of like get under collateralized and get potentially liquidated. And just the amount of sort of risk we have to downside moves in the ETH price is pretty limited. You know, I think like our like first real liquidations would come into play at around 1200, something like that, um, which, you know, can happen, but it's like, it's not a huge risk. So that's number one. And then number two is that because like Notional's interest rates are fixed, I think that one, Notional is going to be a less attractive place to try and play this merge because like when you borrow ETH, you have to commit or you're essentially committing to pay an interest rate for like uh, a period of time that's longer than just like the next two hours, right? So we, we aren't going to have this like crazy spike in interest rates because like on Compound, you can just borrow and then take it out two hours later, right? And there's no commitment because it's a variable rate thing. But on Notional, you're committing to pay for a long period of time or like a longer period of time anyway. Uh, so one, I just don't think that like you're going to see like interest rates go as high on Notional just because of that fact. And then two, if they do go high, it's even more attractive for lenders because it allows like people with ETH capital that they want to lend to take advantage of this stuff. They're able to lock in a high interest rate for a long period of time. Whereas like if they lend ETH on compound, like, okay, sure, it's 100, 500% right now, but in four hours, it's going to be right back down to 0%. Whereas if they like lend ETH on Notional, uh, you know, like they'll be able to lock in that interest rate for, for weeks or months, right? So it's just like, I, like, I think that this effect is going to be far less pronounced on Notional because it's a fixed term, fixed fixed rate product. Got it. It Ma- makes complete sense. We've covered a lot of um, really interesting topics here. And I just have one final question for you, which is that outside of everything that we've discussed here on upcoming developments, new products, etc., what else is on Notional's long-term roadmap? Other stuff coming up. We're launching this Leverage Vault things, Vault product. There's going to be a lot more of these Leverage Vault strategies um, that we're going to build, and and you know partner protocols are going to build with us. Um, we've already got some of those in the works, and and uh, uh, we're going to have more of them. So that's coming. Now I think that that is going to do a lot to stimulate borrowing demand. After that, though, Notional still has things that could be improved. You know, for example, the liquidity providers that we that we talked of earlier, um, they're extremely important to Notional's success. And like to date, Notional has been forced to incentivize them quite heavily uh, with the node token. And that is not ideal. And so I think the next batch of upgrades to the core protocol after launching Leverage Vaults are going to be focused on improving liquidity provider returns and efficiency. So both increasing the amount that they that they make and then decreasing the amount of liquidity that the protocol needs to get the same results for end users. The goal of that is basically that we can like massively reduce the amount of like token incentives that we're paying to liquidity providers. Because uh, basically I think of actual protocol earnings as like like we're generating all these fees but we're paying, but we have to pay these massive amounts to liquidity providers. So I think that like, you know, where we need to get to is a point where lenders aren't incentivized. We're already there. Borrowers aren't incentivized. Leverage vaults, I think, is going to get us there. And, and, you know, obviously borrowers aren't currently incentivized on Notional, but we just don't have that many of them. But leverage vaults is going to get us to the point where we can grow the borrowing base without incentives. So those two guys aren't incentivized. And then liquidity providers, we got to get to a point where they're not incentivized either, right? And then once you get to that point where like all three user groups are using Notional without incentives, uh, the thing is self-sustaining. And then at that point, the fees you make is like, that's actual profit. And so the next batch of upgrades after Leverage Vaults is going to be focused on liquidity providers so that we can uh, dramatically reduce token incentives and and actually get to protocol profitability. That sounds amazing, especially if I think of what we work on at Token Terminal. We're all about fundamentals, organic growth, and net profit. So you know, you put it very well there. Uh, can't wait to see um, how things develop from here. I really appreciate all the insights you're 
able to share here on both broader DeFi and especially Notional. I think there's a great overview. We managed to explain some pretty complicated concepts in a simple manner. So really appreciate you joining, Teddy. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Yeah, it was great.